concert not long ago, and he said, I was from Brooklyn before it was cool. To which I say, we were always cool. Yeah! <laughs> it's true, you ever go on Wikipedia and you look at the list of people from, from Brooklyn and it's like mind-blowing. It's everyone you've ever watched on television since television was invented. Um, they probably invented television. Probably. We probably did. Um, actually, that was Farnsworth. Um, anyway. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Um, so, when I was growing up in Brooklyn, um, my mom had me young. She had me at 18, and my mom was this, like, competitive hip-hop dancer. You know, she was like a B-girl. It was late 70s, early 80s. And um, I always say, like, the easiest way to describe it was that it was like, you got served meets the Warriors, because <laughs> the Warriors is the right time frame, and they had matching vests. Um, and this was like what my mom did, and my mom was very like, you can be anything you want, you should be an independent young woman, you can do anything, and what I wanted to be really as I grew up was I wanted to be one of the Beastie Boys. <laughs> and I didn't realize that that was like a thing that I wouldn't pull off for a while. Um, it took a few years to figure that out. But I, that's what I really wanted to be. Like I looked at them and to me those were people that I looked up to. They got to make the music that they wanted. They ran around the city that I loved, that I watched the sunset over every night because the building that I lived in in Brooklyn in East New York was very tall and there was nothing directly in front of us for a while, and I could see all of Lower Manhattan. And every night, I would watch the sunset over the city. And in the summertime, when I was four or five, and your family's supposed to put you to bed at eight, and the sun still hasn't set yet, I would argue with them that I was at least gonna wait until the sun was down. I loved looking at the city that I was growing up in. I wanted to be part of it more than anything, to just explore Brooklyn. I loved the weekends with my grandfather where we would go to all the specialty shops and pick up everything that we needed for a feast that day. You went to the bagel place to get bagels. You went to the meat store to get the meat. You didn't go to just one big shop. I didn't even set foot into a Walmart until I was 18 and I was thoroughly confused when I did. Um, and so I loved this Brooklyn and I love the energy that these guys brought. I wanted to be the Beastie Boys. I wanted to like do what they did. And as I got older, my, my life started to follow a path that was similar to theirs without me even realizing it. Um, when I was in high school, we would drive around in my friends' cars, and because why would I have a car? Um, and we would drive around and we would listen to No Sleep Till Brooklyn and we would scream it at the very top of our lungs. So proud that there was this song that was very specifically about where we were from. My friend Mike D, who went by Mike D, would sit at parties and he would just interrupt anytime anybody played the song Girls, and he would just rewind the part that said, Jack and Mike D to my dismay, over and over and over again. And I was the only person who ever found this terribly entertaining. And then one day I was listening to the radio, I was listening to Q1043, and the the DJ like finished playing a Beastie Boys song, and he said, you know, back when I was in high school, like um, Adam Yalk, who is also better known as MCA, he was like, Adam Yalk used to hang out in the courtyard, and you know, people would smoke cigarettes there, and that was everybody. And I was like, that sounds like my high school, because I went to a high school called Arbiter Armuro, where we didn't have any sports teams, we had a killer chess team, and we were very lax about smoking policies. And so we would hang out in this courtyard, and everybody would just like smoke cigarettes there. It was a really artistic school. It wasn't even intended to be an art school. The arts just flourished in the absence of sports. And so that's what we did. We hung out outside. And so I was like, I wonder if he's talking about my high school because I didn't know that one of the Beastie Boys had maybe gone to my high school. So I called the radio station and I got the DJ on the phone and I asked him what school he went to. And sure enough, he said, Edward R. Murrow. And we talked about how he had known Adam Yelf in high school and how that's where I went now and how certain things were totally the same. And then he played another Beastie Boys song after we got off the phone. In college, I went to NYU, which is where the Beastie Boys met Rick Rubin, and they made some of their music in the Weinstein dorm. I didn't live in Weinstein, but I would often go there for food, and I would think like, oh my god, it's so weird, they were hanging out in a bathroom up there making food. After college, I moved to Los Angeles, much like they did for the Ill Communication album, and I continued to kind of pursue doing what I wanted to do, which was really to make things that I wanted to make with my friends, because I didn't see why you wouldn't make things with people you cared about when it was clearly so fun, because that's the way that they did it. You know, I would look, I pursued comedy. I went and I wrote sketch. I made shows with all these different friends. We made our own flyers. We did what we had to do to promote our shows. We did everything that we wanted to do. And to me, that was the ideal. Be as responsible as you can be for pursuing your art without ever having, without ever stopping having fun doing it. And do it with the people that you care about the most. That to me was the lifetime ideal. And then over the years, like randomly, I would just think of them, like for no reason. Like I would, ran I, I looked it up too recently and it's like, I look back a couple years and just like on a day that has nothing to do with them, I just tweeted like, doesn't matter how old and gray they get, I will always be in love with all of the Beastie Boys. 
And so one day um, last year, I went to Hale and Hardy to get soup and salad, as you do. And I sat down and I took out my phone to like scroll through Twitter because I wanted to you know, read something. And I start seeing these really like cryptic tweets that don't make any sense. And they're all about MCA and Adam Yao, the same person, but you know, people are referring to him both ways. And at first I can't tell what's going on, but everyone's talking about him and I don't know why. And then finally I see the one tweet that just completely breaks my heart and it says, RIP MCA. And I realize that one of the Beastie Boys has died. And I just start to cry into my salad immediately. I'm not the person that like sees that a celebrity has died and go, oh my god. And I'm definitely not the person who makes fun of those people because I think that's rude as well. But I just couldn't handle it. This was someone who had specifically, at almost every stage of my life that I could think of, influenced me in some way. And I realized that it just didn't exist anymore. And I walked around with the Beastie Boys music in my headphones, and I sat on a park bench in Manhattan just crying. And then the next day was the follow-up realization that was almost worse in a way, that that meant that the Beastie Boys were no more, because I couldn't see the other two pursuing new albums without him, at least not under that name. So not only did one of them die, but they ceased to be, and it was just too much for me to handle. Time passed days and a couple weeks, I think, even, and nothing had really happened. There wasn't, like, some gathering where people could go see his body or anything, and so it's just, like, weird. Like, if you're a fan, people were, like, reaching out, and nobody really knew what to do. And then this guy from Boston named Mike Kearney decided to set up something called MCA Day, where he gave everybody the chance to kind of come together in Union Square. Now, at the time, I was in grad school, and I had to do some reporting for journalism school, and I had to, like, go take pictures of this event in uh, East Harlem, but I knew I wanted to get to Union Square by the early afternoon. The thing was scheduled to go to maybe three, but it was so impromptu and just kind of organized on Facebook. We didn't know what it was going to happen. And so I like took all these pictures in East Harlem as fast as I could, and I rushed downtown. And the whole way there, I was just thinking, like, I know this is just a thing that a guy from Boston posted on Facebook to get a few people together in Union Square, but I feel like they might come. And when I got there, the first thing I saw was Ad Rock standing in the middle of a crowd of fans, just talking to them. And I kind of not pushed my way, but just kind of like made my way up into the group. And he talked to a few people and then he turned to me and he was just like, hi, I'm Adam, how are you? And I was like, uh, I'm Daisy, hi. <laughs> and I was wearing my high school t-shirt because that was the only thing I could think to wear that was appropriate to the event, my, my Edward R. Murrow, like gym shirt. And he noticed it and we talked about it and we just kept talking and he kept asking me questions about my life and he was like, what do you do? And I told him, oh, you know, I do stories and I, with this group, the moth. And he's like, oh, I have a friend who did that before. And he like taps his wife, Kathleen Hanna, on the shoulder. And she's from La Tigra and Bikini Kill, which is also incredibly cool. And she's like, oh yeah, our friend did that. And they start talking to me. And we're just talking like people. Because not only am I finally met this person that is an idol to me, but he is being incredibly kind and just as cool as you'd want them to be at a time where I absolutely needed him to be. And then... After we finished talking, this guy came up, this, you know, youngish guy. I could tell he was a couple years older than me, but he was like a small dude, like a kind of guy you'd look at and go, that guy listens to the Beastie Boys. <laughs> and he, like, came up, and he was crying, and he interrupted them, and he was like, I'm really sorry to interrupt you guys, and, uh, but I just want to tell you one more thing, Adam, and he just basically, like, goes on and on about how that was, like, his childhood. And, and Ad Rock looks at him, and he goes, you know what, man, we did grow up together. And it was just so kind to like see this happening. And you could tell that Ad-Rock needed it too. You could, he had that, that sad, drained look on his face as somebody who had been crying for days. And as Ad-Rock went to talk to more fans, me and that guy in the yellow shirt, this guy named Matt, started talking. And he and I ended up standing there talking for like an hour, maybe 90 minutes about how we'd been fans forever, what we loved about it, what that, where that had taken us in our lives. He told me about being a DJ in LA and meeting his wife. And the moment she walked into the club, he knew that that was the woman for him. And he told me about being a young father, and I told him how I'd just gotten engaged, and we just talked, just, just intimate conversation that you don't have with people normally. And then I heard Ad-Rock say to his wife, like, I, I think I'm ready to go. And he turned around, and he looked at me and Matt, and he walked back over to us, and he came and said goodbye to us. And Matt and I managed to somehow not shit ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> and then they left. And it was amazing. And then me and that guy, Matt, have kept in touch. Like, we are Facebook friends now. When my engagement broke up, he sent me a very kind note about how smart and cool and interesting I was. I comment sometimes on his pictures of his daughters because they're adorable. We talk about the Yankees via Facebook. I mean, like, we just kept in touch. I met his wife. She's amazing. He's like a stay-at-home dad, and she's like this woman who works in computers, and they are so damn cool. And it's just this guy that I met, like, one time 
but we both love this thing and it's the same, and we loved it in such a similar way. They had another MCA day this past Saturday. It was one year since MCA died, and I couldn't go because I was working on a project just too far out of reach. And he went and he talked, and then he filled me in on later on how the event had gone. Um, I loved it. It meant the world to me to have that moment. And it was one of those things where it's so sad that that could only happen in the wake of the thing that you didn't want to have happen happening. But I loved that it did happen. And I loved that they were so cool and that it validated every feeling that I had ever had for them over the years. And so later last year, you know, in the fall, in September, when Jay-Z opened the Barclays Center, I went on opening night. I didn't get tickets when they originally went on sale. I bought scout tickets. Um, they were expensive, so I went by myself because that's how important it was to me to be there. I was like, I'm a Brooklyn native, I have to be there, I love hip-hop, this is going to be great. For two hours before the show started, a DJ played, and he kept doing things like being like, is Brooklyn in the house? Oh, no, no, not the people that moved here, are the natives in the house. And then he would be like, we love you too, transplants, but this is a homecoming tonight. And then he would say like, oh, if you were born by this year, you would know this song, and he would play all these like random old hip-hop songs. And when he put on No Sleep Till Brooklyn, I know that there were all these other people there, but I guarantee you I was screaming the loudest. Thank you.